All right. We need music. Come on. Start it now. That's good. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Welcome to the new All eyes on the New World Order. This is Lies Wide Open on the FPRN Radio Network. And now, Chrissy Sumer and Monograph. All right. That was great. I like that. It is Friday, May the 16th, 2014. And we have Carl here. Hello. Hello, where is he? Oh, what you doing, boy? Hey, you, you stay away from me with that lawnmower blade. I'll get you. Don't You're you mess with me. me. Stop no. it. No. No. I ain't getting you no more. I'm going to leave you alone. Just as long as you bring me my mustard for my biscuit, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, it was hilarious. I and we know, of course... Uh, the mm-hmm. listeners obviously know that that is not the voice of Montagraph. Montagraph will be joining us shortly. As I stated, it is Friday, May the 16th, 2014. We are here with Lies Wide Open. We've got Chrissy Sumer, and we've got Tattooed1009 with us tonight. And he's uh, guest hosting with us, uh, kind of filling in for Monty. So what's new, Tat? What you got going on? Uh, not a whole lot. Just hanging out. Uh you know, we was talking earlier about uh, the harp situation, about the little episode about them shutting it down a little bit, but about that, that's about all. That's interesting. I saw something about that. You know, I, you know, I don't research harp very much. Uh, it's not something I know a lot about. I'm sure that you guys, uh, specifically you and Dutch, know a lot more about it than I do. It's not something that I follow as much, just because it's... It's a bit tedious. You have to really dive into it a lot. There's a lot. To, there's a lot to learn. A lot to stay up on. Yeah. It's constant. It's a constant thing. They're changing something, downgrading it, upgrading it. Uh, it's just a constant thing. And all the lies that go along with it is the biggest problem. People saying that it can't happen, and people saying it can, and people saying it can't. And, you got one that's got a little bit of money. He's pretty wealthy, and uh, he started a whole metabunk thing about it. And he talks about it all the time. Well, that's another thing that people don't really understand when it comes to harp, and I understand some of it. Uh, people say that weather modification is not possible. Uh, I just direct people to the Beijing Olympics and the Chinese cloud seeding in an attempt to reduce the pollution in the atmosphere. I'm sure we all remember that. Mm-hmm. That is weather modification by definition. That's exactly what it is. And people so, don't... They're, they're, they're really not paying attention to everything. They get pits and pieces of this and that, but they don't fully pay attention to everything that's happening around them. They're too busy, you know, into some kind of either a drug or a TV or a radio or music or uh, whatever they can do to occupy their mind not to want to pay attention to what's really happening. The opiate of the masses. Right. They just Entertainment. They, right. They want entertainment. And as long as they get all the free stuff that this country's allowing to keep that going, that's what we're going to get. That's all I can see. Yeah, and that's another thing, too. And this happens on a day-to-day basis. People don't understand this. But if people are eating, people are drinking, people have shelter, and people have entertainment, conditions for revolution do not exist. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because people looking at the TV and looking at the sports and, and whatever – 
exactly. that was one of the things uh, with the, the march that was supposed to take place on, in Washington, D.C., the armed march. Uh, I felt that that would have led to a confrontation that we really would not have been beneficial to the people of this country at that time. And the reason why is because the conditions for revolution did not exist. Right, and, and it's still if something, Yeah, exactly. And if something bad had happened there, it would have given the authorities the ammunition they needed to try to promote nationwide gun confiscation or registration or limitations on the types of weapons we could own. Exactly. It would be playing right into their hand. I agree with that 100%. And I don't think that we should do any protesting. Not, not that it's not good to do that, but right now, in my personal opinion, and I hope that I can get a lot of people to understand what I'm trying to do, is for people to just stay home one day. That's a lot of money. Don't buy no cars. Don't buy no houses. Don't buy no boats. Don't buy... Don't go to the store and buy a pack of cigarettes. Don't go to the store and buy a TV or a stereo or, or whatever, a car radio, speakers for your car. Everybody stay home for one day and not spend any money. That's billions of dollars that that's going to hurt this country. They're going to have to start listening to us instead of them telling us what to do. Yeah, and that goes right down to one of my plans, to where if the people of this country were that concerned, and if it was, and it is concerning the direction a lot of things are going, the power is with the people of this country. If everybody just didn't go to work for a day, can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, it everything would, would stop. Exactly. The power that they have, they have because we allow them to have that power. Right. We can exactly. take that power away. By staying at home. And I Mahatma give them power. Gandhi. We're all familiar with Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi right? That's basically what his plan was to expel the British from India. Passive resistance. Not to just, not to fight the, the occupiers, but to simply deny them control. Exactly. They tell you to get up, sit down. They tell you to sit down, stand up. Exactly. Do and when opposite. they open fire, yeah, and when they open fire, On the crowd, it looks very bad on them on the global stage. Exactly. But if you're in your own home, they got to come to your home to do that. And that looks even worse. Absolutely. Now, if, if Gandhi in India had raised an army and attacked the British occupiers, the colonists, they would have it possibly them. would have gone a completely different direction, too. Because then the British could have gone to global status that our people are being massacred. You know, we're being attacked. Mm -hmm. And they would have had more global support. Whereas, you, whereas everything it, coming out of India was just the British annihilating these people and just wiping them out. And it happened on a few occasions where they did just that. And it just, global support for the British involvement in India went through the, through the floor when the world started learning about that. Mm -hmm. They couldn't use the propaganda against the people because the people wouldn't allow it. They the refused. They would not allow it. The people would not allow it. That's right. That's what this country needs to do. We need not to allow it anymore. And yeah. we keep doing it. And you saw this actually. The, the colonial powers actually, they set up specific types of systems within countries to allow them to control ease, more easily. Like, for example, the Belgians in the Congo, they ran things by what is called company rule. In a sense, it was like a corporation ran the country. But what they would do is they would seek out different African tribes who had differences. Some of them had lighter skin complexions than others. And they would, look, they would act more favorably toward those with lighter skin complexion. And they would turn them against the others. And so they would turn tribes against each other. When the Belgians pulled out of Congo in the late 50s, early 60s, the entire country went to hell. And it's been a state of perpetual warfare ever since. It's 2013, or 2014 now. They're mm -hmm. still experiencing civil war in that country to this day. The individual who was 
trying to unify Congo in 1960, his name was Patrice Lumumba, was actually executed by the Belgian intelligence services and individuals working with the CIA because he was trying to bring people together under one banner to unite the Congo. And they still didn't want that because even though the Belgians were pulling out and they were not going to keep ownership of the Congo, they still wanted to be able to maintain economic control over the Congo. They wanted to be able to get their companies in there to to operate the rubber plantations. And they did this even after Congolese independence. They would actually go in and if, you, if, the, if the individuals working on the, in the rubber plantations weren't working hard enough, they'd cut an arm off. This was going on as late as the 1960s. So when you see things like that, when you see the opiate of the masses, so to speak, and, and how, to, how to oppose them without fighting, without aggressively engaging them in combat, it works out pretty well. If it's done right. If it's done the way Gandhi did it. And not the way the Congolese did it. That's true. Because That's I guarantee if there was if there was a power vacuum in this country right now, we would we would dissolve into civil war. It would, this country would be balkanized, much like Eastern Europe was after the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, you've already hearing you've already heard about states wanting to secede from the union. Yeah. If this country balkanized and split up into several different nations. It well, would see, be what the they the American Empire. That, what they're trying to do anyway, and that's probably <clears throat> that's probably insiders doing that anyway. They infiltrated the the groups to tell them well, that's the right way to go, but in in turn it really isn't because once you do that, you're doing your what you just said is is dividing the country, and that's what they're trying to do anyway because they're putting everybody in these what do they call them. Uh, Different zones, I forget what it is. There's like 10 of them. Uh, districting. Well, they district. Yeah. They do this They do this on the state level, too. Uh, they actually divide voting districts up to, to sway the outcome of elections. The redistricting of Texas was a prime example of that. And then, of course, you see the way this works is the British did this actually in the Middle East when they pulled out after the Ottoman Empire dissolved. Uh, the British were basically running large areas of the Middle East, and they drew the boundaries of modern-day Iran, Iraq. They And they did this in such a way as to make sure that those territories overlap different tribes that did not like each other to promote infighting. That's called divide and conquer, divide yep. and rule. If you can get your enemies to fight each other, they're not fighting you, and you can go in and you can rape the country dry. That was the plan. And what went on with Israel after World War II, that wasn't the U.S. that caused that. Uh, the British actually carved off that section of land and said, this is now Israel, and we're going to let all the Jews live there, and we're going to push the Palestinians out. And since the British, the British then washed their hands of it, and we inherited the problem with supporting Israel against against their enemies which surround them on all sides I don't I don't understand how the United States government would allow themselves to be put in a position to inherit that huge problem it was a British problem that became ours um, that's pretty much what happened to all of us we are all back under British rule really I mean I'm not saying that to hurt the British people's you know, livelihood, but that's exactly what's really going to happen to us <clears throat> is that the British still own us. We're, that's what's happened by the, the Act of 1871. Yes. That's what happened British to us. Government. I mean, we're bought and sold. We sold our soul to them by signing, giving them our birth certificate the time we were born. Yeah. yeah there's, you know? there's, the British Empire may be gone on paper, but it is not gone. No, it's not. 
the British they Empire is still the most powerful empire that doesn't exist on Earth. Right. <laughs> Next to the Vatican. Know, it's, a, it's an economic empire. It's not a Two, military empire. No, we're the military. Two percent of the money in the Federal the Reserve stays at the Federal Reserve. The rest of it goes to England. Yeah. <laughs> England doesn't have that large of a military. Uh, they don't need that large of a military because they have ours. The same with Canada. People look at Canada and say, well, Canada doesn't have very large of a military. It's because Canada doesn't need a large military. They have ours. They know that if somebody invades Canada, we're going to be there. If somebody invades England, we're going to be there. That's happened time and time again. Most of the weapons used by the British in World War II and World War I were provided by us. I mean, we were sending Thompson submachine guns to the British Empire by the hundreds of thousands in World War II. Yep. Through the Lend-Lease Act, which was basically the We Give You Arms Act. <laughs> they call it the Lend-Lease Act. Uh, basically, they kept all that stuff after the war. We gave it to them. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was direct military aid that was presented in such a way as to where it wouldn't look like direct military aid. How can we keep <clears throat> how can we keep giving everything that we make in this country away and not expect anything back in return? Do we ever get paid back for the stuff that we've done for other countries? No. no we don't. And, and, and in a sense, we they would say, or many people would say, that we're doing it because we're trying to do the right thing. And in some cases, I actually believe that we are. But in a lot of cases, we're not. Our involvement in Panama was not for the greater good. Our involvement in Grenada was not for the greater good. I know usually it serves the United States um, military's interest if we're providing aid. There's something that we want. Well, yeah, well, here's something that a lot of people don't understand about what happened in Grenada back in the early 80s. Uh, the nation of Grenada approached the United States government and stated and asked for a loan, in a sense, to build an airport. They wanted an airport. It, it was a great tourist destination. Uh, the Grenada actually has pink sand on their beaches. It's a beautiful place. If you've ever been there, if you ever had the opportunity to, to see it, I would, I would recommend going to Grenada. If nothing else, just to see the place because it is a paradise on this earth. And it, it was a huge tourist industry there. They went to the United States government and said, we, need, we want some grant money so that we can build an airport so we can bring people in here for tourism. And the United States government declined. They went to Canada. The Canadians declined the same way. Uh, eventually, on their list of potential donors, they came to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union agreed to give them a loan and to help them build this airport. And they started constructing the airport. And, of course, the United States Defense Department saw that as a threat because the last time we had Soviet interests building anything in the Western Hemisphere led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they were concerned about that because you've know these, these Tu-95 bombers that you've been seeing a lot in the news lately, these big silver prop-driven aircraft, it's a Tu-95, it's a bear. Uh, the airport, uh, the airstrip they were building in Grenada – was large enough to accommodate those aircraft. And that made the Defense Department very, very nervous. So they needed to find a creative way to eliminate Soviet influence in Grenada because they were afraid of that airstrip. The, the Soviets actually made a pact with the Cubans for labor to help build that airport. So there were Cuban construction workers that were actually working on that airport. They were actually shot by the United States military. And the United States military stated that they were Cuban insurgents. They were concrete workers. They were pouring concrete, and they were shot. And then, of course, you have the individuals who were in the, the university. They claimed that they, they had held hostages at the university on the island. And... Those, those students, and I've seen numerous 
numerous interviews with those students, they were kidnapped in the middle of the night, thrown on C-130 cargo planes, and flown out of there against their will. They were not being held captive. They were kidnapped in the middle of the night. I just don't understand why we just keep allowing, <clears throat> keep believing in the propaganda that they feed us, knowing that it's legal for them to push propaganda, knowing that they have the right to throw us in jail for no reason, without a trial, without a jury, and we keep believing in our heads that everything's going to be okay. And every day they're constantly battling us about our guns. And police officers are going around and some of them are good cops. But there's just some of them that are just totally, they're worthless. They shoot dogs. Yeah. They shoot people for no reason. Yeah, like did you hear the one about the cop that shot the chihuahua on the porch? No, I didn't see that one, thank Because God. he was fearful of the chihuahua on the porch? No, I didn't see that one. Speaking of which, I got a little rant about Ted Nugent. On his Facebook, he posted um, a picture. He's smiling. Um, I guess, you know, he's a hunter and whatnot, so he had some traps out, and one of the traps, he, he got a dog. It's not the just the fact that he trapped a dog. It's the fact that he took a picture holding the dead dog smiling and he's like you know if this bothers you you know so what it's just yeah, don't don't worry about ted nugent he's just got <laughs> cat scratch fever so i'm sorry i just wanted to do that he's, little rant because it made me mad ted I'm like, nugent, what an ass. yeah I, yeah i understand where you're coming from but think about I, i'm not a fan of ted nugent to be honest with you uh he supports gun rights me and him see eye to eye on that that is the only thing that we see eye to eye on and I find well, that, that to be the too. case with a lot of people. Um, uh, Nugent is Every, one of those people who is looking for attention. Every person out there, we all, we all have our own glitch of what we believe and what we don't believe. Some yeah. of us are very hard-headed about it as well. But the problem of it is, is we got work together on something I mean we really do <laughs> yeah I mean if we say enough's enough and everybody just stay home one day yeah and we see that it, and if the people see that it works and something happens and we get they lighten up and stop talking about all their propaganda bull crap and then a couple of weeks later they go right back to doing it, do it again next time make it two days or whatever. Once yeah. the people see that it works, then they'll stand up. I mean, all the mother countries over there, they're, they're standing up and screaming democracy. And what they're really begging for, and it's happened in this our country as well. Every time they go and start screaming democracy, they get democracy. They go and beat the living dog piss out of them. And they do. Y'all know that as well as I do. I mean, you start screaming that you're begging for it. They're giving you what you're asking for. It's not democracy you want. You want freedom. Quit screaming something that's not right for you. I'm sorry, guys. I get a little passionate when I get Oh, I understand. I understand that 100%. I and think that's that we thing. need to start a movement that start studies. a Facebook page and try to get people in on it because this is only going to work if uh, enough people do it. Yeah, and All I've right. been looking at some studies and things. Um, I can't cite them individually or directly. Uh, if individuals want me to, I guess I could. But America's United States, not America, because Cubans are Americans too. Mexicans are Americans too. I don't like the term American. When you talk about Americans, you're talking about Argentinians, Chileans, Colombians, Venezuelans, Canadians, Mexicans. We're all Americans because we all live on North and South American continents. Citizens of the United States, uh, I've actually noticed that while we are the greatest country in the world, everyone keeps telling us, uh, but there's a very high rate of depression in the United States that you don't see in other countries. And when you consider our status in the world, there's no 
logical explanation for that. There's no reason that it should be like that. Why are Americans not happy? Why are citizens of the United States not happy? Citizens of Argentina are not unhappy. Citizens of Canada aren't particularly unhappy. So what is what is causing this? Why why do we have this what's eating at the people of this country? There's something that's eating at the people of this country. And maybe it's because they feel that no matter what they do, nothing changes. Nothing's getting better. They see this gradual decline. And yet, we seem powerless to stop it. In the 1950s, a household, a a man could raise a family on one income in the 1950s, could own a home. In the 60s, too. In the 60s, too. The 1970s and 80s hit. Now you need two incomes, two decent incomes, just to scrape by. Right. And it got worse. And it's and getting worse. worse and worse and worse. Now it almost takes two incomes plus a part-time job just to buy enough gasoline to go back and forth. When gasoline shouldn't cost near as much as it does, it's only because they put it back on the stock market again. So it costs you more. So the refineries make $10 billion a month, and they quit talking about it after we brought it to the light. And nobody even talks about it anymore. And they're still making that same amount of money every every damn month. I mean, there's there ought to be a limit to greed. But there ain't. Greed is greed, and it's in you, and it's going to stay there. And people have to stand up to the greed. This is just like the unions when they first started. They needed unions because the same thing was happening then. And now the unions aren't worth a flying flip because they're just as as corrupt as our government. They are. Definitely. They've been lobbied. They've been lobbied. Right. They're lobbying for stuff to do stuff in in the government. I think I might know part of what's going on. You got the gas prices, which are causing everything else to be inflated. Extremely. So as gas prices go up, food has to go up because of the price, the cost to deliver the food to the store. So right. they have to raise the prices on that. And then they raise they raise the minimum wage. So mm-hmm. when they raise the minimum wage, the companies who are manufacturing food or gas or whatever have to raise the price of their product because they don't want to cut into their profit margin. No, no, no. They have to keep that profit margin the same so they raise the price of their of their goods. So that leads to inflation. Inflation's a huge problem, too. But I want to look at something else. In this country, we're basically all indentured servants to the banks. And this is how I can say this. If you have a mortgage, what happens if you don't pay your mortgage? You get kicked out of your home. You become homeless. Exactly. You lose everything. So you have to go to work in order to pay for your mortgage. Most of your income is going toward your mortgage, or most people's income. I mean, not mine, but most people, most of their income is going toward their mortgage. Now, let's look at this and say, well, a lot of people would say people who are renting are not slaves to the bank. They're not indentured servants to the bank. And you're right, they're not, but their landlord is, and they are a slave to the landlord. So that puts them even lower on the food chain than the indentured servant. They're almost like a slave. Because they can pay for 40 years and never own that property. That's right. But it actually, in reality, they really, even if they do have a piece of property and it's paid for, they don't really own it because they're paying tax on it. Something that started in World War II that should have ended after World War II. And that's just like they're taxing our incomes as well. It shouldn't be there. It's unconstitutional. Exactly. And then we have the most massive redistribution wealth that occurred in late 2008, moving into 2009. The most largest redistribution of wealth in human history, going from the poor to the rich in the form of taxes, tax money being paid in the form of bailouts to banks. And it was supposed to make everybody, it was supposed to go into the poor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make everything better. 
to uh, FDRN Radio. Sorry I'm late. The butler is cooking. <laughs> so I might have to step away for supper again. Sorry. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Another lunch break? You come in late and then you take another lunch break? I, I, I had things to do, baby. Things to do. Yeah. I'm sorry. Hey, we got Tad here. <laughs> Shame sure on you. you. that. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, you guys go ahead and continue your conversation. I'll, I'll try to catch up. Oh, well, actually, uh, we were just discussing failed foreign policy, the bailouts, redistribution of wealth, and why Americans have a high depression rate when it's out of proportion with our standing in the world globally. Why do you think that would be, Monty? Why do you think Americans uh, would be depressed? considering our position in the world. Well, if, if we'd get our, our heads out of our ass and stop giving all this money to all these countries that don't even need it and take care of our own business instead of minding everybody else's, we'd be better off. Well, that's you know? true. I, I mean, agree every, with every that. Time you turn I agree around, with that. We have the failed foreign policy. Uh, but I was thinking as well that I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Americans don't feel like we have any control. Uh, pe- citizens of the United States don't feel like they have control over what their government does or or laws that are being passed. It seems like there are constantly more restrictions being placed on us every day that none of us, not one of us, have voted for. That these people who we send to Washington to represent us are voting on without our consent. The bailout being one of them. They wanted to – that the people in general were against the bailouts. All the polls stated that the American people, citizens of the United States, were against the bailouts, yet Congress voted for them anyway because they knew what was best, right? Mm-hmm. Because they were the smart ones, and they knew what was best. They'd have been better off to gave the money to the people instead yeah, of to the exactly. Banks. Exactly. It, it, trickle up economics rather than trickle down economics. This is where we're going to get into Reaganomics, and it's probably going to upset some people. Reaganomics is a failure. Tax breaks on the rich and corporations does not put money in the pockets of the poor. Under Reaganomics, the concept is if you give tax breaks to the corporations, the multi billion dollar corporations, they will in turn pay their employees more. No, they won't. Mm hmm. The greed sets in. No, they will not. Exactly. Mm. That hey guys, was we have Greg. Basically, that was one of the one of the installments in the systematic robbery of the American people. Trickle down economics, Reaganomics was a failure. Just like our foreign policy is a failure. And a lot of people I think this actually hurts our standing in the world because it's widely believed globally that ethnic ethnocentrism plays a pivotal role in the formulation and implementation of u.s foreign policy and by ethnocentrism what i'm actually referring to is the idea that people view us as racists we got involved in the the genocide that was taking place in bosnia but we did not get involved in the genocide that was taking place in rwanda People globally view that as a problem, that we're not interested in helping everyone, just people who look like us. What I don't understand about race in this country, and we're one of the biggest, or mainly the only one, but we're the biggest. There's a few others, but this one's the biggest one. And we have more different races in this one country than all the rest of them combined. And I don't understand why we have such a big race problem here in this country, other between the whites and the blacks. I'm not talking about all the rest of them, but just the whites and the blacks. And We're I'll tell you why. The same. I know why. Because a lot of the a lot of the African Americans who are alive now were baby boomers and they grew up during segregation. They haven't forgotten that. And you know right. what? You know what, to be honest with you? I wouldn't forget that either. Well, I understand that, that part. I mean, some I things do. are unforgivable. And I understand, I, can understand that too. I can understand where they would be holding a grudge because I sure as hell would be. 
And we're trying to make it right. We're making it right. I think that all in all, we have made it right overall. And I think moving forward, as those generations fade over, fade into obscurity, and the newer generations start to come up and start taking control, I don't think that race is going to be as big of a problem as it once was. At least I, I have hopes that it won't. But well, there's, there's also, yeah, there's also a deep-seated guilt in the American psyche over segregation and even slavery. We have that that guilt. Well, that you we know, you know what's really bad about the slavery part, though. Did you know the first slave owner in this country was a black man, but he wasn't called a black man. He was called an Englishman because he came from England, and he was free. Yeah, and he was a senator, too. By the way. In this country, back in those days, yeah, and there were a lot of. I mean, even during even during the Civil War, you had individuals like Frederick Douglass. I mean, this guy was a big deal. A freed slave, he was a free man. He was a free black man, and he had such a high socioeconomic status. I mean, if people see his image, they recognize him to this day. They that's Frederick Douglass, you know. And we have this, but we have this guilt when it comes to slavery, but we don't have this guilt when it comes to Native Americans. And I don't really understand that. I have trouble understanding that. Maybe it's because there aren't as many Native Americans left because for the most part, they were all killed. Maybe it's because and the that ones guilt, that are, and the ones because, that are, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the ones that are still around have elected to stay on reservations. So maybe well, it's no, the, that, the guilt there is some, there is some that have bred out and spread out and become part of the system. In other words, they become partially Indian, partially white, or whatever other race there may be in them. Well, I'm, I'm quarter Cherokee. I know Cherokee. that because I am partially that. I am too. I'm quarter Cherokee, which <laughs> is interesting enough because in this region, Monty knows the region that I live in, and you probably have an idea too. Uh, I've, given, I've given a lot of cues, clues to where I, I'm at, but my family lineage, lineage in this area goes all the way back before the Revolutionary War. And I actually have family members who actually engaged in combat. I have ancestors that engaged in combat against General Tarleton before the Revolutionary War started. The first battle between Americans or colonists in the New World against the British, one of the first battles was actually near the Cumberland Gap region of eastern Kentucky. So, and people say that I'm from, you know, New Jersey or whatever. But we see this with the the Native Americans. And what I was basically kind of getting at was that there aren't as many Native Americans around because most of them were killed. So that, that guilt... That judgment is not staring in the face of Americans as much. And that in and of itself uh, speaks volumes because our memory is kind of short, but we've all learned it throughout history. They spent more time in schools on the slavery. They spend more time in schools on the segregation because those are still fresh. Yeah, those those are still fresh in people's minds too. I mean, our parents lived through it. Some of us have lived through it. We remember when it was Mm -hmm. like that. Nobody was alive during the Trail of Tears, which is by far the worst atrocity ever committed by Westerners on this continent. That was genocide. Those people were marched halfway across this country. Those who couldn't walk, those who couldn't walk were killed or left to die. Children Uh, included. Babies included. I'm fixing to tell you something. Yeah. If we don't straighten our country out right real soon, 
You're going to see that again, but it's going to be worse this time. It's happening in places of the world right now. I know, but it's going to be it's going to be in your face before long. Yeah, and it ain't going it ain't going to have race involved. It's going to be anybody they want it to be. If you don't have the right amount of money, or you don't have the right skills, I think a lot of it's going to be based on in that situation. A lot of it will be based on. Well, we see this happening all over the world right now as we speak. We look at the Trail of Tears and we think about how horrible that was. Basically, almost an entire civilization completely annihilated. I mean, we look at what what Cortez did to the Aztecs, and that's why I say it was one of the worst atrocities. Because I have to say, the Trail of Tears takes a second second place to the Spanish conquistadors in South America. But it's, it's still happening. When we talk about these things that happened hundreds of years ago, like it's a distant memory, but these things are still happening in other parts of the world just because it's not happening here. And the U.S. government isn't concerned with the Hutus and the Tutsis in Africa. They're not concerned with what's going on in Sudan. You hear people talking about it and speaking out about it. Yeah, it's going to do a lot. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. You know, they didn't talk about it when it was going on in Bosnia. They acted because that was Europe. Because our finances were in jeopardy, and the European finances were in jeopardy. Money was in jeopardy. You cannot have a stable economy without having a stable political region. You cannot have a military conflict going on in a region where you're trying to do business. It's bad for business. Mm -hmm. Nobody was interested in doing business in Rwanda. Nobody was interested in doing business in Burma when the military junta there was wiping out their own people. Look at what Pol Pot did to his own people under the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Nobody cared about that, yet we were concerned about the communist North Vietnamese when it was the communist North Vietnamese who had to go into Cambodia and put a stop to that. Those people were our enemies. Those were the people that we deemed to be subhuman, our enemy, the vicious members or satellites of the evil empire. Yet they're the ones who stood up when the time came and dealt with that son of a bitch in Cambodia. It was the North Vietnamese who dealt with that, not the great United States of America. And I think it's despicable that we're going to sit there and say that we're always doing things that are for the, for the just and for what's right, and that we're going to take out the Taliban because they have Sharia law. When there are atrocities going on in the world, at any given point in time, take your pick, that the Taliban pales in comparison to. The Taliban are amateurs when it comes to real killing and slaughtering people. One need only look to Sudan, to Burma, to Cambodia, and the things that happened in those countries during the last half of the 20th century. And they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Hell, the Taliban were considered our allies against the horrible Soviet Union. What happened? They suddenly became such an enemy because 9-11, yeah, that was it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> you know, it's garbage. It's all done for economic reasons, mm-hmm. not, for, not for humanitarian reasons. And this is the problem. And I think that ethnocentrism does play a large role in the formulation and implementation of U.S. foreign policy. And it's disgusting to me. Because we pride ourselves on being the melting pot. The nation where all races are welcome. All religions are welcome. As long as you're within our borders. If you're not within our borders, then it's open season on you. And we'll slaughter you wholesale if we can make a buck off of it. Or we'll turn, our, we'll turn the other way while somebody else does it because there's no money in us. There's no money in it for us to stop you. It's 
Sometimes that's a I doubt. don't think there's no money in any of what they do. I don't think they there's money in it for them. them. There's money in oh. it for them. Everything they do is for a very clear and concise reason. They have plans going down the road, just like Putin. Putin wanted to control Crimea because he wanted to use that as a deep sea port for his navy, because he wanted access, unabated, unrestricted access to the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. He's wanting to move to the Horn of Africa next. Keep your eyes open on what Putin decides to do in the Horn of Africa, namely Somalia. He is going to seek to establish a presence there. You can mark my word, it's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. There's going to be a Russian presence in Somalia. It happened throughout the Cold War. The Russians ran Somalia and we ran Ethiopia. We switched sides at several points during the Cold War to where the Russians moved into Ethiopia and we moved into Somalia. At any given point in time during the Cold War, Somalia or Ethiopia was under U.S. or Soviet influence, one or the other. Because we both want to control the Horn of Africa, because you controlled the main sea routes from the Indian Ocean into the Mediterranean Sea. It was great for trade, commerce, as well as military movement. As so fast as they move, and I don't think it's going to be no 10 or 15 years. It may be. I'm, I'm saying within that because you have to get them time probably, to formulate their plan. I understand well, well, what you're hold, saying. Hold on a second, guys. I know this is what but, Putin wants. Hang on a second, guys. Let's bring in Greg, shall we? <laughs> yeah, let's bring in Greg. We got nine minutes to break, though, so we'll have to pull him over, maybe. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Greg. Hey, Greg. Greg. Hi, sir. How you doing, Monty, Chat, Agent Smith? What's happening? How you doing? Oh, doing great, man. I don't know. Now, Greg, how, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you because several weeks for... ago you called in when we were talking about fluoride, and you being right. a dentist brought a lot of a lot of material, a lot of insight onto the show, and I just yeah. wanted to tell you that I thank you for that. We appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not good, not good for you. Absolutely. Uh, so, what's on your mind tonight? Oh, uh, I don't know. I I just. Just listening to you guys, and I love everything you're saying. And I uh, just thought, you know, if you guys wanted something on Fuki, I can Fukushima, I can do it. I mean, boy, is it shaking today? Well, yeah, the Fukushima update. Okay. Uh, can I? I want to go ahead and just make a, a quick, a quick reflection on what I've just stated about the United States' role in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I do love my country. I was born here. I was raised here. I would fight for it, and I would die for it. I don't care for a lot of it, but what I care for, I do care for a lot. And that's why yeah. I ask these tough questions and why I make the tough statements. Because people need to know not only the good things, but also the bad. There's a flip side to every coin. That's that's that, right, being said, yeah. that being said, that being said, please, Greg, continue on with what you had. Well, I don't know. Did you want me to discuss Fukushima? I, I, I oh, you can. that on Duchess, yeah. but I didn't. And hey, Greg, you're the caller. Um, you, can, you can discuss whatever you want. All right. Do you how many how many callers do you have? You got one coming or do we have uh, well well we've got yeah. you, we've got Tad on the line and uh Monty's here, but he's being surprisingly quiet. Yeah, I think he's just trying to catch up and see what's going on. I think, I think his yeah. butler's bringing him more dinner, is I think what he's doing. And no, I'm I've just I've had a I've had a long day and um, uh, I'm waiting for some food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. That the butler's bringing you more dinner and you're waiting for it or you're eating it, one or the other. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you. Hey, tattoo. Thanks for the, that. I think it's a 23 minute long video that you did. Oh my god, that is so awesome. You did a great job on that. Oh, you mean the one I did this morning? Uh, oh. gosh, did I see it like last night? God, I'm just losing track of time because I'm not sleeping. <laughs> you know, was it about heart? Three hours and twenty four. It's kind of tough on the body, so especially when you're sixty years old. So, was it a, <laughs> was it about heart? Five or six weeks. I mean, this sucks. There's so much crap going on. Was it about heart? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the one and I did this morning. Doctor Bagich was on Infowars today, and he never hit heart completely. What I wanted to hear was that no, it's not shutting down because they they shut down in, in June or July, and you know just for maintenance and maybe replacement parts. Mm-hmm. And 
and then they 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 go back up to full power by the end of September. So, right. you know, I think it's BS. You know that that they're going to shut down. I, I, they need that facility. So, I don't know. Well, they might I, have better antennas. Like I said you know, when I made the video, the guy that that actually promoted the video to make everybody think it was shut down is the same clown that goes yeah. against Harp anyway. He's the owner of. Uh, Meta, and he's a big skeptic and yeah, a big troll as well. This information campaign thing going, I think. But you know, they might have better at those uh, seventy-two foot Raytheon on our phased array antennae are probably. God, I remember talking to Doctor Begich. We used to I used to call him like every week. You know, when I had when my dental practice and I. I just use my business line to talk to him. And, uh, you know, what? like between patients or somebody canceled, I'd give him a phone call. And, uh, geez, uh, this, this tower's got to be 20 years old because they just started putting them in, I think, in the 90s, like, like 1990, I think they started putting the towers in. And I think Baggage and I were talking like 92, maybe, 94. So, man, I'm, I was bugging him. I mean, he's starting to probably get pissed at me because I was calling him all the time. You know, because he's a busy boy. Angels don't play this hard. Yeah. So, I don't know. I get mean, I, what do you I would love for him to call I like that. I like what that. Big, Angels you know, don't I'm, play this hard. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Where's well, that's a true story. <laughs> I mean, he wrote the book with Carol Mann, so... You know, they're both PhDs, so. Uh, what I was thinking. In, in, his that, show, in the show, that he was on the show, radio show today. Did he oh, talk yeah. about art? Yeah, you can watch, watch the rebroadcast, you know, do it tomorrow or something. You can do it tomorrow because it's what? It's uh, 11. Okay, well, thanks for telling me because I didn't know that. I, I mean, I haven't, I, I really ain't had time today to do anything much, yeah. but uh, yeah. I'll check it out. Yeah. I'm glad he come out this time with that information because the the video that's actually put out was done by a senator from up there and I don't even know there there's no documentation other than the video and how do we know that the video is even real yeah that, I mean, that could be the true. video was be real uh, you know we know that it was actually uh, being shut down and they're saying. fully funded so I don't know what's going on you know, they cut, obviously, cut their, uh, what do you call that, just the blogger line or whatever, you know, they cut that line so we can't look at the, uh, oh, gosh, what do they call those, ionograms? Remember the ionograms you used to be able to get? You could pull up the ionograms and see where they're pulsing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember seeing those? Oh, yeah. I used to watch mm -hmm. I used to watch those several times a day, see how it's going. And, you know, they pulled that line down, so, you know, so yeah, we're lost. That, um, and last just, May, I, think. I think they're just doing disinformation campaign. And the other idea I had was that maybe they have brand new antennas that they're going to set maybe right, because I know they have the property to do it. Maybe they're going to build a new antenna system, take down the old or begin to dismantle the old and start putting in the new antenna system. So I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. Man, well, I don't, think, I don't really sure think that they're going to actually close it. I think that's just a gimmick to get more money for some whatever yeah. reason and get the government to pay for more money to uh, give them more equipment that they want. They want to upgrade some equipment or something. And it's just some kind of ploy to get somebody else to in there to do it. To the stupid, which is you if the shoe fits fuming, marching through this like the All right, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Lies Wide Open on SPRN Radio. I'm your host, Christy Sumer, and I'm here with Tattoo1009, uh, Agent Smith, Monograph, who's off with the butler, and Greg, uh -oh. our... <laughs> One of our Hold favorite on colors. Off the butler, that just didn't quite sound what quite right. Yeah, what, what, are you doing? What, what is he doing with the butler? Yeah. Wait, stop, stop right there. I do not want to know. <laughs> Ain't like that. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh goodness. Um, <laughs> you guys are great. Hey Tat, man, I'm so with you on 1871. Damn. We gotta man, we gotta go back to 1789. I am not a British subject. You know, dude. Well, right now you are, brother. If you got a birth certificate, you belong not, to them. I'm not, I'm not doing it willingly, I can tell you that. I know it was done before you were born. And me. And everybody else. Yeah. All the only problem is is waking people up to the fact and get them past yeah. the race part because they got one little paragraph in it. It's got something to do about the Ku Klux Klan and everybody turns and runs. Yeah. And uh, it's ridiculous. Well, I've that was the best way that. that was the best way to hide it in the world. I've got some Absolutely. interesting information about the Ku Klux Klan. Hide actually. it behind a villain. Yeah, hide it behind a villain. You know, you always have to have a villain. Mm -hmm. You know Go what ahead, I'm talking about? Chris. Oh, well, you guys are familiar yeah. with uh, with why the Ku Klux Klan was originally formed, right? I've done a little bit of stuff it, on that, it, but not a lot. It wasn't formed as a racist organization. Uh, what they had was, during Reconstruction, that is the period from 1865 to 1877 following the, the Civil War, uh, the Union would actually have troops stationed throughout numerous locations throughout the South. And the troops would oftentimes be very naughty, it, to use a term that Monty uses. They would go and they would rob people. They would attack people and whatnot. So a lot of individuals, they formed what was what was originally kind of termed as the ghosts of the Confederacy. That's where the, the, the sheets and hoods came from. And they would pay visits to certain individuals in the middle of the night who were, who were robbing people, who were extorting people, oftentimes who were raping women, occupying soldiers, Union soldiers who were, were raping women, things like that. And an individual, I believe it was the Washington Post, wrote an article it was a very carefully contrived article uh, stating that the ghosts of the Confederacy were trying to resurrect slavery and that that's what they wanted. And they were the Ku Klux Klan. General Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, out of Tennessee was one of the individuals who was key in forming this group. And uh, literally overnight, the Ku Klux Klan became a rallying point for racists everywhere. It's specifically throughout the South, individuals who really despised African Americans. And they joined this Ku Klux Klan because they thought it was this huge racist organization, which in the beginning it was not. And they, in turn, transformed it into the racist organization that we see today. Yeah. General Nathan Bedford Forrest actually left the organization that he founded. He turned his back on the Ku Klux Klan because of what they had become. And General Forrest was a slave owner. He had a lot of slaves. In fact, a lot of Nathan Forrest's slaves fought with him. They supported him. There were actually That's slaves who fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And I think that a lot of that was, some of it was out of fear of what their owners would do if they, if they didn't support them. And I think that that's, for the most part, true. There were some who were able to understand. Not many, because it was illegal to have an education at the time, if you were a slave or if you were African American. But they knew that the plan to free the slaves was incomplete. They were freed, which means they could leave the plantations, and they could go out and get their own job. However, there were no laws on the books stating that they had to be given equal opportunity for employment. The laws were still on the book saying that they were not allowed to have an education. They were not allowed to learn to read and write. So in a sense, many of them stayed on the plantation and continued living right. as they had had before slavery was abolished, simply accepting a wage from the slave owner. So basically, a lot of it didn't even change immediately. And they lived under those conditions until, I mean, actually, I mean, it, it changed 
they were they were given gradually given more and more rights as as time moved on but the hugest the, the largest step as far as them being able to be counted as as equal citizens came not until the 1960s so you're talking a hundred years after slavery had ended right Man, and they're just that- now getting to where they need to be in order to be successful well, they had to keep those laws so they could keep their hidden agenda hidden for another hundred years. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know this either, is that Abraham Lincoln gave freed slaves an opportunity to leave if they wanted to, to not remain in the United States. And they actually set up a nation in West Africa. That nation is called Liberia. If you look up the Liberian flag, their flag is identical to the U.S. flag, only it has one star instead of 50. That's Pretty very boring. interesting. That's a part of history that people just don't know. Yeah, It's not taught in schools. That people say, oh, why didn't they just send them back to Africa? They gave them that option if they wanted to, and that was great. I think that it was, it was, it was great of Lincoln to give them that option because, to be honest with you, if I would have been one of them, I would have had great contempt for this place. I would have been one of the ones that got, that went back. I would not have wanted to stay here. Yeah. I mean, why I would you want to with- stay in a place where you're not wanted? You know, I wouldn't do that. I, hey, I want to go back to be with my go you guys. The way The way they were treated was just out of line. It was just disgusting. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. May I interject for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, You know, you know, Title 10, Section 310 and 311 of the U.S. Government Codes setting up the militia and there's uh, organized, you know, that's the military and there's the unorganized. That's us, right? Well, guess who's the trainers of the, uh, of the actual you know, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, was responsible to train citizens to be good firearms owners with safety and whatnot. But the NRA was created to arm the black people that were freed to fight the Ku Klux Klan. So that's awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, I love yeah. it, man. I, I go. You know, NRA is racist because that's what that's all they say out of Obama administration and and the black people in Congress that are a bunch of freaking communists. You know. Oh yeah, there's another and, uh, thing too. Actually, you're saying talking, the about freeing the slave or arming the slaves or arming the the, the freed slaves. Uh, there was an individual who launched a, an attack on the armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, prior to the Civil War. His name was John Brown. Many people don't know who he was either. Yeah, I know the guy. I don't remember a lot of history about him, but yeah. I remember reading he was a considered. Lot, you know? He was actually That's considered to be a terrorist at the time. Brain, brain cells are going at 60, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the, the United States Go government, the Union now, uh, yeah. actually hung him for raiding yeah. the, the Army barracks at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, arming droves of escaped slaves. Who were fighting for their freedom, mm-hmm. and the United States government executed him for that. And this is another reason why I honestly feel that the Civil War was not fought over slavery. Here's one one piece of evidence to to, to support that. We all remember the Emancipation Proclamation, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, that speech wasn't given until 1862. And it only freed slaves in open rebellion against the United States government. The Emancipation Proclamation was given in 1862. The Civil War started in 1861. Okay. This was about the forced industrialization of the South. You want to be helping me a whole lot more than you're helping. I'm going to whip you. 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 Me? Oh, he's going to whip you. Where's the whip? 
<laughs> because you you got some more knowledge about what it, we're do, what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah. You're just good at what you're doing right now. That's all. Chris is very knowledgeable. Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Well, I don't know many people who give compliments while threatening to whip. <laughs> but, but it's I do not, do not use, like, yeah, do not use hey. that sound effect right now. <laughs> <laughs> give me my whip. It. <laughs> All right, guys, that's enough. <laughs> I'm getting jealous. Can you give me a couple of whips too? I need three of them. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Hit me again. <laughs> oh, yeah. It defeats the purpose if he likes it. <laughs> That's from the dominatrix, right? I know. I know. He's a masochist. Come on. You don't whip a masochist. You deny him pain. That's how you punish a masochist. <laughs> but, uh, Great. Oh, that, that's, there's just a lot of things that that are right there in the Library of Congress. It's, there's another thing, too. Now, this is something that they use to confuse the issue and a manipulation of the English language. If you go to the Library of Congress and try to look up records on the Civil War, you will find very limited material and content. And the reason why is because most of the records are not filed under the Civil War. They're filed under the War of the Rebellion. If you go into the Library of Congress, yeah. research the War of the Rebellion, not the Civil War. You will find everything that you need. Like General Sherman. Here's one for you. General Sherman. Now, not, now the Confederacy was, was a racist state. I'm going to say that right now. And there were individuals within the Confederacy who held the African American in the highest of contempt. They despised them. They believed they were subhuman and that they should not have been freed. In fact, that was that was actually a, a widely accepted view, not only in the South, but in the North as well. There were some individuals out of southern Ohio who started their their business capturing freed slaves or escaped slaves along the Underground Railroad and returning them to their owners south of the Mason-Dixon line, which was the Ohio River. Now, these two individuals, many will know today by the name of their company. That company is Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. Many people do not know that when the Civil War ended and, the, and slavery was abolished, they had to find another way to make money. So they expanded and started making soap and things like that. Procter and Gamble. This is why Procter and Gamble put up most of the funding for the Freedom Center that is located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Because if they were putting up the money for it, they could control what went into it. That's why I didn't like that movie um, Strive, because it came from a gamble. But there's something else too. Let's let's not let's not forget, or let's not get to drawn off topic, but we're discussing slavery and how the Union, Northerners and Confederates, Southerners, were racist, were equally racist. I give you William Tecumseh Sherman. William Tecumseh Sherman, while he was marching through Atlanta, I can't remember what river it was, it may have been the Savannah River, he had slaves following his caravan, his, his lines, moving with his men, seeking protection begging for protection. And he grew annoyed with them. So what he did was, I believe it was when he came to the Savannah River, they built a pontoon bridge to march the, the army across. And when they got to the other side, they forced the freed, the escaped slaves to wait on the other bank while they pulled the pontoon bridge up. Well, the Confederate army was in hot pursuit. And you can imagine what happened to those escaped slaves when they got there. Sherman basically left them to die. He was not interested in slaves. He was not interested in human rights. He was interested in killing as many people as he could because he liked it. General Sherman 
was a psychopath. That's made that. him an effective general. He was able to go through the city of Atlanta that was populated by Americans just like him. Americans that Robert E. Lee would not even call the enemy. Robert E. Lee would say, those people. He would not call the Union Army the enemy. He refused to do so. If the Union Army held a hill, he would say, those people hold that hill. And then you had people like Sherman, who got their rocks off, burning an entire city to the ground. Yeah. And one of the greatest losses of life of the civilian population in the entire Civil War. And he prided himself in doing it. And he burned everything in his path from Atlanta to the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, March to the sea, huh? General William Tecumseh Sherman was a war criminal. Yes. He was more of a war criminal than any of the Confederate generals. In fact, Lee was in charge of the Confederacy. Nathan Bedford Forrest, who founded the Ku Klux Klan, actually was one of the generals who never officially surrendered at the end of the war. He was widely believed to be the best cavalry commander on both sides of the entire Civil War. Him and Patrick Claiborne. Patrick Claiborne was a great commander as well. However, John Bell Hood, being a scumbag, disliked him, sent him to his death on a suicide charge, and I believe Franklin, Tennessee. But Forrest never lost a battle, and he never surrendered. One of his key phrases that people remember him by is, if he was surrounded he would divide forces and attack both ways. <laughs> but he was a wild he was a wild general and he was and he, of course he led cavalry. But these people were all human beings. In the Civil War, they like to paint that in the American classroom as black and white. It's about good and bad, right and wrong. And it's not. It's about, it was about politics. And they used slavery as an excuse to do what they were doing, the forced industrialization of the South. Which was never effective. It never happened anyway. Yeah, you have industry in the South, but never to the extent as planned. I mean, the Industrial Revolution was going on. And the southern states preferred to stay agrarian. And it was not popular among the northern states. So that being said, I mean, they talk about Sherman's march to the sea like it was such a great thing. Be honest with you, if I would have been one of Sherman's men, I would have executed him on the spot. As soon as he stated that he was going to burn Atlanta, I would have executed him as a war criminal. And I would have accepted my punishment. Like, you know what? That man was going to burn a city full of people to the ground. Yeah. And hang me for that. Hang me. Because there's an entire city full of people who are alive because of what I did. And I would have smiled while they did it. And the same thing with John Brown. You're going to execute this guy for doing, for helping these people, or trying to help these people. When just a few years later, that was I believe the 1850s he did that. I can't be certain. Harper's Ferry, Virginia. And then just a few years later, they fight a war. And they, they hijack they hijack his message or his intention to use it for their own pathetic agenda. And John Brown's still viewed to be in the wrong. And they still do that to the day. They still hijack every... I think that John Brown, John Brown is an American hero. 
He's every bit as, as much of an American hero as George Washington, as Abraham Lincoln, probably more so than Abraham Lincoln, because he was honest to the end. Mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln suspended Congress because he was afraid they wouldn't vote for his war. He suspended Congress and essentially became a dictator for four years. People don't want to hear that, though. People do not no, want to hear don't. that. Nope, they no do way. not. And they say the Confederacy fired the first rounds of the Civil War. They attacked the Union first. Well, that was because Union, the Union decided they wanted to post warships in Charleston Harbor and stop all trade coming in and out. I tell you what, another country wanted to put a blockade off of our coast, stopping trade from coming in and out. How quick do you think we'd sink their ship? Yeah, these topics here I know nothing about, very, very little about the history of all that. So I'm glad you do. Yeah. He does. I'm actually proud of him. Hell, he knows more than I do. (laughs) Well, Robert Lee, Robert E. Lee was... I think his problem was he didn't have the bitter hatred. He didn't want to kill Grant. He didn't want to kill McClellan. I don't think Grant wanted to kill him either. I think they avoided confrontation that would have led to that because they knew each other. They were friends. Robert E. Lee, shortly after the Battle of Antietam, which was one of the bloodiest days in American history, Uh, He could have marched straight into Washington, but he chose not to. He was hoping that after that confrontation, it's called, I believe, the the first battle of Bull Run, too. There are a few other names that battle. You'll see a lot of that. Civil War battles, uh, the Confederacy called it something different than what the Union called it. But Lee could have taken Washington but he chose not to. He didn't want to take over the United States. He wanted to defend his territory. He wanted to defend against those invading his territory. Now, there were others in the Western theater who who saw things a bit differently, people like John Hunt Morgan, who many people don't know about, but he was one of the most successful raiders of the American Civil War, a guerrilla, so to speak. And he ran a, a campaign from he ran from northern Tennessee to Cleveland, Ohio, was captured, escaped, made his way all the way back to, I believe, Chattanooga, Tennessee, rallied his men again because they all knew the rally point, and went on another raid through the state of Ohio, burning railroad trestles. That was his big thing. And it caused huge problems for the Union in that theater because they couldn't move their supplies on the rails because every railroad bridge that he came across, he burned. And they had this thing they called uh, they called Morgan's neckties where they would pull the rails up and they would heat them up with fires and they would bend them around trees and leave them there like bow ties. Oh, they called them Morgan's bow ties. <laughs> That's pretty good. Tactic. And I don't hear about these people. I mean, I heard about that one. I mean, these guys were, these guys were incredible, but we're on, we're going to another break. I got to stop talking about this because I can talk for years. <laughs> Welcome to Wise Lives Wide Open, guys, and bringing us back in tonight, we got, everybody's here tonight. We got a whole group of people. We got Monty, got Chrissy, we got um, Agent, and we got Greg is also with us tonight. Yeah, I'm with you. Greg is still I'm on. With yes. Hey, man, that was some great history. I love it. Oh well, there's more. There's more actually. Uh, Patrick Claiborne, the one I was just telling you about. Hey guys, he created hey, hey, hang so on a many second. problems hang on a second. for the Union during that war that when they caught up with him in Chattanooga, I believe, they executed him on his lawn like a dog. Yeah, hey, Monty. Yeah, yeah. I hey, I just, I just yeah, wanted to it. say, I wanted to thank, uh, we used to have, you know, some great listeners, and I just wanted to thank, I just got a, a little email from a guy named Christopher, 
I wanted to thank you so much for listening to our show. Every little bit helps, no matter how little. I mean, oh, absolutely, I absolutely. And I maybe, just appreciate maybe it. Thank that individual you so could much. learn something. You should should make sure he perks his ears up a little bit. And the gray ghost, more. That's it. There he is, John Hunt Morgan. Sorry, Marnie. I had to. I saw outlaw, outlaw shooter thirteen post this in there. Uh, the gray ghost. Yes, I believe there's a book about him entitled The Gray Ghost. Actually, I can't be a certain on that. But uh, that man was one of the most successful raiders of the Civil War, and most people don't even know his name. Well, he was a Confederate, of course. The Union didn't do a lot of unconventional warfare because they didn't have to. They had huge armies. And you have um, moving through, like you had the Battle of Vicksburg, uh, which was a, a key turning point in the Civil War, where Grant was able to take the military barracks at Vicksburg, which was a choking point for their supply lines coming through the western western frontier. But, you know, I have, I know a lot about the Civil War, and it's very close to me, because I had relatives, I don't like to call them ancestors at this point, because they're really not that far down the line. Um, I mean, my grandfather spoke with these people, knew them. So I heard their stories through him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people were, I mean, they're real people to me. They're not ancestors. They're not just names in a history book. These were people that I was related to who fought on both sides. And there's a really interesting, it's a really beautiful monument that they have in the town of Mount Sterling, Kentucky, uh, which is a bit north of me. But they have uh, graves they have a really nice monument in the center, and it's a, the graves are arranged in a circle. And you have Union soldiers around the top, the northern edge, and Confederate soldiers' graves along the bottom edge. And they were all part of the same unit. They split when the Civil War started. I mean, wow. literally, it was brother against brother, specifically in the state of Kentucky, and even in the state of Tennessee to a degree. West Virginia... A lot of these border states, the states that actually were on the Mason-Dixon line, which if many people don't know what that is, that's the Ohio River. It essentially divided north and south. And West Virginia actually, before the Civil War, was part of the state of Virginia. And it split off during the Civil War because West Virginia uh, was, was more in alliance to the north. But it was one of those split states. It wasn't really considered neutral. And... It's – Kentucky is, is a lot different when it comes to Civil War history because you still have that. In the northern parts of the state, you have people who are pro-Union. and In the southern parts of the state, you have people who are pro-Confederate. And it's all a mix in between. But we don't hate each other. We, there's remember, not animosity. Remember ye, are, remember ye are brethren, the vision of George Washington. Yes, and that's another thing to consider, too, because a lot of the descendants of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence fought for the Confederacy, not the Union, because they didn't believe in, in the strong federal government. That's another thing that people don't really take into consideration. The first form of government that we had in this country was the Articles of Confederation, which was... The states hold all power. The federal government is a very weak it's, – it's there basically to tie us together for, for the purpose of determining foreign policy, not domestic policy. The federal government was not supposed to have a standing army. The state was to have standing armies. And that's what the Confederacy – really supported as well. It wasn't just the forced industrialization of the South. It also it also held back to that, to the Articles of Confederation and what the Southern states preferred as far as their system of government. That's why it was the Confederate States of America. Their ideal was to have a weak federal government and strong state government. 
and Lincoln did not like that. And I can, I can sort of understand why. Because if we didn't have a federal government, we wouldn't have the military power that we have today. Because you would have all these different states who would be basically raising their own armies. And it's very easy for states to get teed off at each other and start fighting. I can understand that. But at the same time, under that system, your life and how you live your life is not dictated to you by someone 3,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away or even 500 miles away. It's dictated to you by people who live right alongside you. And it's not dictated to you at all in a sense because you're part of that decision. And the federal system, the system that we have right now, we do not have that. We elect these representatives who go and represent us. But in a sense, they get to make up their own mind how they vote on any type of legislation that's dropped before them. They can vote with their constituents or not. They can choose between their constituents, which is the voters in their district, their state, or the corporation that gives them money. Right. The money usually wins. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not saying that this couldn't happen under the, the Articles of Confederation, because it could happen very easily. However, it's more difficult to get that much power. Because you have to pay so many people that it gets to the point where it's no longer economically viable for you to do so. That's why I don't like a two-party system. You got Obama running against Mitt Romney. And you're a multinational corporation. You're a huge multi-billion dollar conglomerate. And you want to make sure that when your guy gets elected, you get what you need. What's the best way to guarantee that? Such is politics. Been there, you done pay that. Them both. Seven years worth. Don't you want pay them no both. more. Two parties, two candidates. It's a lot cheaper to pay two candidates than say twenty. That's why yeah. you got insurance today. It's 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 the mob. Yeah, paying money to Al Capone. <laughs> that's, that's basically what it is. I mean, they league. They went through the system. And did exactly that, lobbyist and lobbyist and lobbyist and lobbyist and lobbyist. And there was yeah. a time that you didn't have to buy insurance. Now you yeah, got to have one my, just to drive a car. Yeah, that's what my dad always said, paying money to Al Capone when he has to pay his insurances. You know, mm-hmm. malpractice or yeah. whatever it would be. Easier, yeah, let's take a look at Al Capone MD. real quick. Yeah. Why did Al you Capone know, have the power that he had? Because during the Depression, yeah. Al Capone took yeah. better that care of his people than the government did, than hey, the corporations did. When he got up to 300000 a year, he said, you know what, fuck this, I'm done. <laughs> I quit. Al, Al, Capone, so, Al Capone knew how to take care of people. Yeah. Uh, he would give yeah, money to people did. who needed. He took care of his people. And Al Capone essentially became a warlord. And he ruled with an iron fist. Yeah. But that's essentially what he was. He owned the city of Chicago. He owned the government. That's why the yeah. federal government had to move in there. Yeah. Because this, the local government wasn't going to do a thing. Because he took care of them too. And at what expense? Right. At what expense? The death of 30 people, if that. I don't know Al Capone how many didn't black. kill that many people, and his men didn't kill that many people when you consider that... He basically whacked his enemies. Most of, the, most of the individuals that Al Capone killed were in defense. They were people coming in to put him out of business. Right. He eliminated mm-hmm. that threat. Yeah. The same way nations do. Right. And, and Al Capone was making his money selling illegal liquor. Yeah, like Joseph Kennedy. Like, just like, what's the difference? What is the difference? (laughs) That's my question. But yet the Kennedys are viewed to be national heroes. And I think that John Kennedy, in a sense, was. However, he did do shady things. Uh, it's, It's widely believed that he had intercourse with Marilyn Monroe. Many people knew it. 
I said Joseph Kennedy, not John Kennedy. Oh, I'm talking about John Kennedy, the, the Kennedys oh, in man. general. Yeah. I mean, Joseph okay, Kennedy go, was a gangster. Keep going. Go ahead, keep going. I mean, and you know his sons were taken care of. Yeah. You know they were taken care of. And I guess it's I'm the not saying that, you travel, I'm just man. saying that Marilyn Monroe's death sent up a lot of red flags in oh, my I, mind I, when I was researching yeah. that. Okay, here's a woman who's had sex with the president. Do you think oh, that yeah. if Bill Clinton could have had Monica Lewinsky whacked, he wouldn't have done it? I don't know. That's one that think still about bothers me. I'm surprised they didn't whack her somewhere in a you know, drug overdose or some BS thing. You know, like a Vincent Foster thing or something. You know, shot herself yeah. in the head. Uh, she's let's say she's left-handed, but she shot herself in the right side of the head with her right yeah. hand. You know that kind of a There's... weird thing, which happened a lot under Clinton. Shot themselves with the wrong hand. You know that kind of a thing. You know the way the coroner looks at it, the trajectory of the of the uh, bullet. Yeah, that kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. They have their ways. Yeah, and you're looking at all these things in all the modern politics, especially yeah. domestic policy. And you're looking mm -hmm. at all the arguments that are being made. We're still yeah. having the same argument that we had when the country was founded. Federalist or Articles of Confederation? You see what I'm getting at? You're seeing people... Yeah. You're, you still have this huge push for states' rights, for the states' right to decide what they do. That's the way it should be. As I think a matter it is of fact, too. Also, I think I don't think we should go as well, extreme as the Articles of Confederation. I do still think we need a federal anymore. government. However, I think, I think state, that the, the states should, should make up their mind on every law on the books, so long as it adheres to the United States Constitution. The original one. The original one. Now, there have been too. changes made. There have been changes made to the U.S. Constitution, the civil rights legislation and all that, uh, giving women the right to vote. I believe women should be able to vote. No. I see no reason why they shouldn't be able to vote. Well, I don't either. Uh, same with Af any, any minority, not just African Americans. I'm just meaning the ones that they backed everything up yeah. on according to the Act 1871. Yeah. Any no, law we're taking that we have, our sovereignty rights away. Yeah. Any law that we have on the books that imposes a penalty for a victimless crime should be done away with. There's no excuse for someone to be in jail for something that did not cause harm to someone physically or financially. There's no excuse Agreed. for it. Yeah, yeah they I got a bunch of senseless laws. Yeah. And, it's, and they never they write laws and they never take them off. That's like mm. jaywalking and it should be illegal to steal from someone. It should be illegal to kill someone. It should be illegal to harm someone. Right, right. And the rest of that junk should go fly out the window. The rest of that garbage <laughs> should go out the window. It should be illegal to drink and drive. Well, because that can lead to kill to hurting someone. It's very right. likely to lead to hurting someone. It's a dangerous activity. Not only to you, but to others. So, I believe that laws like that just stay on the books because there's a potential victim. The seatbelt, the seatbelt law. The seatbelt law. Out. There's no excuse to have a seatbelt law. No, if somebody wants no. to wear a seatbelt, they will. However, I think that if someone is under the age yeah. of 18, they should be required. It's called I common sense. With that. I mean, I've worn a I've, seatbelt. I've seen, seen so many driving. wrecks in my life and been around so many that people got their head cut off from a seatbelt and the ones that didn't yeah. have one on lived. Well, the seatbelt should be, the seatbelt should be redesigned to say the least, because I've seen that too. Oh, I've seen, I've seen collisions involving airbags where the person's glasses had to be surgically removed from their face. Yeah. Oh shit. I'm talking their glasses were in their face, like yeah, in the bone. Mm -hmm. Don't they fly uh, out over 200 bender. miles an hour when they blow? 
Dang, it's like really bad. Yeah. In fact, the first thing I do when I get a car is I disable the airbag. Oh, damn. But I'm not a fan of them because they go off when they're not needed. And a lot mm -hmm. of times when they're needed, they don't go off. Yeah. So what do I want with that? As a, my daughter yeah, when I first recall, when they first started uh, making them, they used to put them uh, uh, yeah. aluminum connector connectors on them, and they found out after a couple of years, if you had a car a couple of years and any moisture got in the car, they would corrode and they didn't work. Yeah. So they started putting gold yeah. connectors on the end of them. Yeah, and like in the seatbelt laws, yeah, I kind of see what you're saying with the seatbelt laws because they the seatbelt itself can harm you. But like if you have little kids. I well, do now it's, the little car. kids need to be strapped in. I agree with that, too. But in a car I'm just seat, saying. too, though, because the car seat's actually safer than the seatbelt. Right, that's what I mean. But I've seen, seat. I've seen bad wrecks where people had babies and, and, and shit in cars when holding them in their lap and just oh, yeah. unthinkable yeah, but Giving things, an adult right? a, a ticket for no seatbelt seems kind of silly because... If, you're Maybe they if, you ever, suicide, if anyone listening know. ever thinks about getting into the, a car with a baby and holding it on their lap, if you'd seen what I've seen, you'd rethink that. Yeah. If you you've seen what I've seen, da, 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 da. Yeah. Yeah, you go to jail in California if you do that. <laughs> Needless to say, the first thing, if something's not secured and you're hit from the front, anything not yeah. strapped down is going to go through the windshield. And it's going to end up somewhere. It's going to stop somewhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Momentum, mass times velocity, times two cars. Yeah. yeah. Something's going to fly. And if you have a baby sitting on your lap. Yeah, I see ya. <laughs> uh-huh. It's out the window. It's 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 a, it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And you know, and people think, oh, I'm just driving down the street. Yeah, until until the jerk off down the road decides he wants to jump in his new Camaro and do 80 miles an hour down a two lane road, drunk. You know, yeah. and then you got a then you got a kid who's nine years old, whose mother and infant sister are both dead, wandering through a creek bed trying to figure out why. Because some douchebag wanted to get drunk and drive his car 80 miles an hour. Uh, hey, excuse me, let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. Basic data, you need to contact me on my I'm Your Ghost channel in the email. Okay, I'm just telling you, we got to talk. Sorry. Did you okay. remote view that they were going I, to? I'm... Okay, I feel like a mushroom. Did well, did I remote view what? That they were gonna contact you on the I'm your ghost channel because they just asked for you to remote view them in chat. That's why I said that. I don't go to chat. I, I know I'm that's just, why I said that. I'm just uh, I don't ever go to chat uh, because uh, it confuses me. So I I can only do one thing at a time. I'm just saying, basic data. You got to contact me on the I'm your ghost channel email. Okay, I got to talk to you. And I'm glad that things worked out for you. All right. Okay, well, we just had an So am I, even though I don't know what there. he's talking about. Uh, I'm still happy for you. Um, yeah, we need to end this on a, a higher note. What do you guys have that's good news? We've made a lot of progress tonight, and I, I think, think we have. I think that people may have heard some things tonight <clears throat> that enlightens them even more to the Act of 1871 than they've ever been closest to. Well, yeah. Absolutely, and I think that anyone who doubts anything that was said tonight through, the, through a little bit of research, everything that we have stated will be affirmed 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And please look it up for yourself. And you can find a lot of information about the Act of 1871 on tattoo1009.com. Can't you key search that for Tats Revolution? 
Yeah, you can search it that way too. Or tat 1009.com. But there's two or, T's in tat. I, I actually, too. I think you can actually put abolish act 1871 and find it as well. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think definitely you own that key phrase, yes. <laughs> 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 for a long time you couldn't search circle without me coming up <laughs> I'm like I can't find anything about circle that I didn't put out there <laughs> yeah and you know I'm reminded of a phrase actually that was used in the, the 1990 film Hunt for Red October and Sean Connery's character said this uh, and he was playing a Russian uh, surprisingly and he was stating this he said a little revolution from time to time is a healthy thing when people think of a revolution, they think of war and killing and all that. It doesn't have to be. Exactly. Sometimes you just need to you need to hit the reset button. Things have just gotten so out of control that you need to just say, "We're going to hit the reset button and we're going to go back to a reboot point." You know. Mm -hmm. And I think we're about at that point now. We, we're getting we, very close. We're past. To we're past. We need to already be. We're, we're getting very close to supper time. <laughs> Are you, the butler is still, you tell me the butler still hasn't provided you dinner, Mom. Nah, no, I was running late. I was running late on everything. I'm exhausted, so I'm glad you guys took over. You know, I really am. All right. Well, well, I want to I thank Tat for mouth. being here tonight. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad Tat stuck, stuck around for a while. Man, you're up late, boy. Hey, I, I, I stuck around. My, my, my buddy over there, he was running a little late. I figured I, I'd help out. <laughs> your butt, butt, buddy? My, 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 I thought you were one of the same. You know what that sounded like, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I corrected it. <laughs> Or we'll, we'll make sure we edit it before we put up the show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's hysterical. Uh, oh, man. God, I'll oh, tell you, uh, hey, you guys, thank you so much for letting me stay for the duration. I'm, I'm a little happy that no one else wanted to call in. So. Well, you know, actually, we never even gave great. out the call in Great history lesson, too, by the way. There's stuff I didn't even know. You know, I'm so involved in what I'm doing. Um, by the way, Fukushima is still going, so I don't know what to do about it. It's about, what, six hours worth of shaking? I don't know what's going on. They had that 4.7 in Kamchatka about 4 o'clock PST. I wonder if so. they got equipment or a generator or something at the base of that pole or something. Because it's Underneath shaking, but plane, nothing else looks like it's shaking. You know what I'm saying? They have three reactor cores that are just boiling in the aquifers. So I'm sure there's a lot of steam generation because it is it is emitting a little bit of off-gassing. Because the, the, the grounds are cracked all over the place. And that's really heavy-duty concrete, too. You know, it's almost like an a airport runway, like 12 feet thick. <laughs> this steam is coming out. I mean... I watched it shake for 10 hours and 26 minutes when, let's see, it was like last Wednesday. It started about 7 p.m. PST. It went all the way to 528. <laughs> and the next day. So I was up all freaking night watching that till it finally calmed down. <laughs> it was crazy. I don't know. All right, Greg, well, thank you for being with us tonight. We're about one well, minute out, so I'm going to take us out now, yeah. Greg, all right? Every second of it. So I already have a thank you note for Ryan here in a second. I'll send it. Um, <laughs> Josh, you guys, I love every one of you, just wonderful folks. You know? All right. If it's with it, pick that. Okay, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight on Lies Wide Open. And if you're listening to us on the podcast, thank you for downloading and don't forget to check out the other shows on FPRN and stick around and listen to the rundown on After Us. Bye. The Baller Stacked 1871 and from my cold dead hands. Damn right. <laughs> Thanks for listening to FPRN. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to start your own show with FPRN, advertise with us or donate to the network or to your favorite shows, 
check out our website at www.fprnradio.com.